Hello, I'm Jonathan Dean, Seattle Opera Dramaturg, and this week's opera talk is about American opera in Seattle, here at Seattle Opera. And uh, yeah, we do a lot of operas in Italian and French and German, and that's kind of why I work for the company, because I'm good with those languages and can make them into super titles. But I also really love it when we do operas in our own language and operas about our people and our songs, our stories, and uh, we're going to have a, obviously the theater is closed now, but uh, we're very excited that on June 13th in our series, Seattle Opera Mornings on King FM, that's where we replay broad performances that have previously been broadcast on King. We've been replaying those on Saturday mornings. And the one on June 13th, we're going to play the new American opera that we did uh, just a year ago, The Revolution of Steve Jobs, music by Mason Bates and libretto by Mark Campbell. What I want to do today in terms of our little opera talk is give you the quickest whistle-stop tour of a lot of other American operas that we have presented at Seattle Opera over the years. And if you're a Seattle Opera subscriber, long timer, you may remember a lot of these shows. If you're just learning about opera, it may sort of be an eye-opener to you that there's actually such a long tradition. And as I say, Seattle Opera never had a focus on doing American opera. There's actually very important American operas that we haven't ever presented, um, but we've got enough that I can at least show you a lot of neat pictures and play you a, just a very few little snips of music so that you get the idea of some of the different musical voices, the different musical languages, as we listen to operas that were composed in the mid 20th century, in the late 20th century, and in the 21st century. With that said, I'll start with uh, chrono chronologically. We'll do these not in the order in which we presented them in, in Seattle, but rather in the order in which they were composed. The oldest American opera that's been done at Seattle Opera, and also, perhaps not coincidentally, the one that's been done the most often, Porky and Bess, George Gershwin's great opera of 1935, written back before that divide between the popular commercial theater, of course, which becomes Broadway, and the sort of refined world of high art, whatever that is. Porgy and Bess is both, and it's such a great masterpiece, and it's beloved and popular, and we do it all the time, so much so that you get a situation like this one, where here's Angel Blue in the photo of her Seattle Opera debut, when she sang Clara in Porgy and Bess when we gave it in 2011. And Clara, as you remember, comes in at the very, very beginning of Porgy and Bess, sings Summertime, one of the best-known melodies in the world, to her baby, currently being cradled by Donovan Singletary as Jake. And she doesn't have too much else. She kind of runs out into the hurricane uh, later on in the opera. Um, well, uh, Angel Blue, sort of, uh, Seattle Opera met her in that and uh, had fallen so madly in love with her when we did it again. She was the best and sort of risen up the ranks. So there she is in 2018 with Alfred Walker as Porgy in another fantastic production beloved, beautiful opera that gets done a lot and is just a, a fantastic experience. There's so much going on in Porgy and Bess. There's a lot, there's a, it's a very complicated piece. There's a lot of uh, conversations we could have about that. Uh, Porgy and Bess, written in 1935, the next oldest opera presented so far in Seattle was actually by Giancarlo Menotti, Italian-American composer, the consul, probably his strongest opera. He wrote a lot of operas. Um, and there's the iconic moment when the papers come flying in and the kind of the, the absolute meltdown of Magda Sorel, uh, played here by Marcy Studinkas, with Sarah Larson as the secretary. Um, a very dark, dark opera, a bitter, savage attack at both the kind of post-World War II crushing bureaucracy of life in the Western world and also specifically of the immigration situation at the time. Um, a, a, a dark piece, undeniably powerful in the theater. Um, let's see, here's a piece that's not quite so dark, The Ballad of Baby Doe, written a few years later, Douglas Moore. This is a piece now that we're stepping away, both Gershwin and... Uh, uh, Minotti New Yorkers or sort of part of that East Coast, the the East Coast establishment. Um, Ballad of Baby Doe actually came out of Central City, Colorado, where there is an opera house that goes back to the 19th century. Um, and it's sort of about the founding of that opera house and this great pageant of American history. In fact, so this is a photo from the Seattle production in 1984 when the great bass Jerome Hines came back to Seattle, he'd only sung here a couple times, to do the cameo role of William Jennings Bryan 
in the Ballad of Baby Doe. Ballad of Baby Doe is about a silver mine and a, a Colorado silver tycoon. So Ryan is there, if you remember, uh, you shall not crucify us about a cross of gold. It's the argument between the gold standard and silver. Vanessa, written a couple years later by Samuel Barber with a libretto by Benatti. Seattle Opera's only done once a very beautiful and very dark opera that uh, is, um, well, yeah, and this is now getting into that, that uh, mid-century era of music that's gonna have to take you to a kind of a dark place somehow. That was certainly the case with The Crucible, uh, which is the earliest American opera. We gave uh, The Crucible at Seattle Opera in 1968. It was only a few years old. This is an opera, of course, based on the Arthur Miller play set in the Salem Witch Trials, but really about McCarthyism and so sort of what's wrong with America and a very uh, intense and powerful story. And they didn't go for it in Seattle in 68. I, I wasn't there, but in Glenn Ross's memoirs, the general director of Seattle Opera, his, his line was, the Seattle public was not yet ready for something like this. He didn't give up, uh, and uh, neither did the composers. There's a couple more American operas that came along the way in here. Um, Carlisle Floyd's 1962 opera, The Passion of Jonathan Wade, did play in Seattle in the early 90s. It was done really for the cast. There's Del Busing as the kind of reforming uh, Northern, the Yankee who goes down to um, do, re, you know, sort of run reconstruction in the city of Charleston, and it all just totally goes to hell in that story. Julian Patrick played the uh, proud old Southern gentleman who'd lost the war and who's had a very pretty daughter that he wanted to marry. Uh, let's see, that was um, uh, Carlo Floyd who wrote many, 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 many um, important American operas. Um, Marvin David Levy wrote this opera, Morning Becomes Electra, originally in 1967, based on the Eugene O'Neill play. It was premiered at the Met. It was very thorny and difficult. And when we did it in Seattle, many, many years later, Marvin David Levy actually went in and kind of rewrote it and uh, simplified, made it a lot easier on the ear. Um, but again, woof, tough stuff. Mar um, the Eugene O'Neill play was basically the old Greek tragedy of the Agamemnon family uh, set in the US after the Civil War. So mom murders dad, then son murders mom, and daughter goes crazy. There's the daughter egging uh, her brother on to kill their mother, who is played in the Seattle Opera production by Lauren Flanagan in a really, really amazing dress. And it was a beautiful production, um, kind of uh, 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 intense stuff, and, and interesting, you know, certainly musically as well. Uh, Seattle, Opera, Seattle Opera's first ever world premiere opera. Carlyle Floyd, who wrote The Passion of Jonathan Wade, and also a very important opera called Susanna, which we haven't ever done, but, you know, are always trying to figure out how to plan. Um, he had written an opera on the John Steinbeck novel of Mice and Men, which got its world premiere in Seattle. Now, Seattle Opera didn't commission it, but we ended up presenting it. And this, again, so this is what I mean about the diversity of America, kind of ranch hands in California in the early 20th century and a very powerful, powerful story, a story that everybody kind of knows, and very dr powerful drama made into uh, this music by Floyd. There's a photo from A Vice and Man of Archie Drake, beloved old Archie Drake, who sang thousands and thousands of performances at Seattle Opera. And he told me once that his, of all of the people he'd ever been with on stage, um, his best scene partner ever was the dog that he played with in Of Mice and Men, because he was able just to break everybody's hearts. His character Candy, uh, this old ranch hand, has this mangy, nasty dog that's clearly just needs to be put out of its misery, which happens at the end of Act One, and it's a real downer, but of course it's also setting you up for what's going to happen at the end of the story of, of Mice and Men with Lenny and George. Anyways, I'll play a little snippet of music just from the end of Act One, and uh, off stage we know that this is happening, but on stage we've got a character called the Ballad Singer, just singing about the emptiness and the homesickness and the loneliness of all these itinerant ranch workers who don't have a dime among them.
Mice and Men. So Seattle Opera's actually given it twice. That recording is from the second time we did it in 1976. And it's been performed many, many, many theaters all over the world. Uh, now, uh, we skip a little bit. Uh, actually, we don't. Hang on a second. Well, that was 1970. I'm going to cheat and say that the next, um, I can't really call it an American opera because it was British. But the next new thing that Seattle Opera did was the Who's op rock opera, Tommy, which was a, a album with kind of a loose story with all these songs that then Glenn Ross turned around the next year and said, well, we'll, we'll put it on. And he did it at the Moore Theater in Seattle and uh, Bette Midler starred in it as the acid queen early in her career and was uh, a road that actually Seattle Opera didn't then follow down, but it was kind of a, a fun new thing that happened right here in our, in our city. And then the next new opera, we have to sort of skip ahead a little bit here. Um, we didn't do it until 1988, but it was an opera from uh, you know, uh, sort of late 20th century, late 20th century music, Philip Glass's opera, Sacha Graha. It was, it was so, uh, we started doing The Ring in the summer of 75, and every summer at Seattle Opera had been Wagner until 88, when Spate Jenkins, uh, the general director, wanted to mix things up and put in Satya Graha instead. One of th Philip Glass's three portrait operas, operas that sort of meditate on a very interesting and intellectual figure. He did an opera, Einstein on the Beach, about the you know physicist mathematician. This opera, Satya Graha, is a Sanskrit word um, uh, meaning, I think, dedication to truth. But it's, it's Gandhi, it's the, the philosophy of nonviolent resistance. And there's another Philip Glass opera on Akhenaten, the, the monotheistic pharaoh. So very, very, very uh, interesting characters and music gets in there in this wonderful way. And Philip Glass, if you've never heard Philip Glass, now this is no longer that kind of Carlo Floyd, Copeland-inspired mid-century musical language. This is Philip Glass's own musical language, um, what he likes to call music with repetitive structures. And music in this case that really does help transport you into this uh, world of contemplation of a, uh, a different way of ordering things, of, of structuring things, of figuring out what your duty is. Here's a little, just a little bit of music from Satyagraha, this opera entirely sung in Sanskrit, no supertitles. So it's not a linear plot driven experience whatsoever, but it has quite strong music. Glass's music, it, to me, puts me into this totally different headspace, which is, it's sort of trance-like, it's meditative, it's very American uh, in a uh, uh, interesting and, and um, always unexpected way. Anyways, it's the only one we've done. He's written a lot of operas. They're well worth checking out. Uh, we're going to skip ahead to uh, the early 21st century. Um, oh, sorry, I've got one more. Oh, yeah, this is a slide of a uh, photo of um, Satyagraha at Seattle Opera. One of the things I wanted to point out about Satyagraha, um, that opera was designed in the original production, the one that came to Seattle, by Robert Israel, who was a big force at Seattle Opera um, for a lot of years, uh, designed our ring in the 80s and a lot of other shows and in inimitable Robert Israel design right here. In Satyagraha, there's um, always a, a figure who's a non-singer who's up here observing and learning. Leo Tolstoy, um, Rubin Adrath Tagore, and uh, uh, Martin Luther King all sort of play little roles up there. So yeah, very uh, interesting, interesting piece. And uh, oh, in the early 21st century, uh, uh, Jake Hagee now emerging as a very, very important voice in American opera. Um, we haven't done his, um, uh, either uh, the two big operas by him that have been making the rounds a lot, uh, Dead Man Walking, um, or Moby Dick, although we've certainly uh, been trying to organize this. We did to The End of the Affair, which is an opera that Jake Hagee wrote about a, a, a Graham Greene novel. Very interesting piece where there's a kind of a sulfurous uh, a 
uh, adulterous affair that gets broken up because um, she dumps him for God. Very Graham Greene, but interesting way to like then enter the music in there. Um, End of the Affair, which for me, actually, I should point out, was stolen by Joyce Castle, uh, who played the very uh, spicy mom of the heroine, who uh, she was a lot of fun. Anyways, uh, that was uh, 2004 when um, Seattle Opera, the next big new American opera that we did, came out in, Amel in 2010. That was Amelia. That was our first complete commission, an opera that we had engaged the composer, Darren Hagen, and the librettist, Gardner McFall, and Stephen Wadsworth, who wrote the story and was the director, put together this very, very, very elaborate production um, and a fantastic opera, very different musical world from anything I've uh, played for you so far. Now, Amelia, um, the story focuses on a American woman taking place in the 90s uh, who is pregnant and she's going to become a mom and her own life kind of has been in suspension ever since her father, uh, whose jacket she's clinging onto in this photo, went missing in action in Vietnam. He was with the US Navy Air. And so the opera is about her journey of trying to find some way of, to have closure with that and to you know, move forward toward the future. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting thinking piece, as well as being a extremely powerful passionate story about death and love and family and war and all those those kinds of things. Here, I'll play you just a little snippet of music from Amelia while our heroine, who's a little girl, is asleep dreaming about this pilot who realizes at this moment, this is it. She, the next thing is she's crashing into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, and what happens musically is she's just way up in the air. She's high soprano, she's got a bunch of woodwinds around her, and it's just the joy, the thrill of flight. Now at the same time, elsewhere on stage, the little girl's mother is resenting the fact that her husband did not say no to a second tour of duty in Vietnam. So you'll hear her voice at the same time, but a little bit of the kind of music and the, the multi-layered -text texture of Amelia by Darren Hagen. Very powerful, and as I say, music that kind of demands you listen to it. Now, one thing about Amelia, it was it was a there was a lot going on, and it was a big, big, big opera. Uh, we've been working on it for many years. It had a fantastic set by Tom Lynch um, with really, really cool costumes. It had scenes in Vietnamese. It had a scene in the hospital. It was that it was big. Now that was the opera commissioned by Spade Jenkins. Uh, who ran the company for many years, Aidan Lang, who took over um, in 2014, um, it took a different direction with the new and new American operas. Oh, sorry, there's one more photo of Amelia. Oh yeah, Amelia doesn't say in the libretto exactly where it's taking place, but the baritone works for a company that designs airplanes, and there's a lot of, there's a big Vietnamese community in the city. So, I mean, it's, uh, a very Seattle kind of story. Anyways, um, what I was going to say was Aiden, um, uh, and actually this has been not just him, but the whole trend of the last 10 years has been to do uh, operas that are not quite such a huge scale. Um, smaller operas, um, shorter operas, sometimes for smaller forces, like An American Dream, which was an opera that we commissioned and created when Aiden Lang uh, had taken over Seattle Opera. Jack Perla, the composer with a uh, libretto by Jessica Murphy Moo. You know, it's been done many times. We've done it twice, and actually it's been done all over the country now um, because it's not so difficult to produce, and it's a really, really compelling story about uh, an American dream, an American nightmare. Um, we did that in 2015. In 2016, we did a two-year-old opera at that point, Laura Kaminsky's opera, As One. Beautiful opera, also a small forces a cast of two with a, a small orchestra, a, a transgender person's journey played by uh, uh, the, the one character played by two different singers. 
then let's see, um, the, again, uh, sort of chamber opera, opera performed in a smaller space. The Falling and the Rising was an opera um, that's also been kind of making the rounds that we did last fall. Um, again, a story crowdsourced from real American stories of people in the, uh, in the US military. And we did that last fall. Um, right before the quarantine hit, the last thing that Seattle Opera did before we had to close the theater down was another uh, small American opera, Charlie Parker's Yardbird, cast of seven, in this case, a bigger orchestra, and a very ambitious, ambitious piece of music. If you saw Charlie Parker's Yardbird, then maybe you still have it in the ears. If not, there's loads of stuff on our website about it. Um, I certainly am glad that I had the opportunity to be involved with it. And I felt very similar about uh, the resolution of Steve Jobs, which we did exactly one year earlier. I'll uh, wrap this up by giving you a little bit of a, just to whet your appetite to go listen to the revolution of Steve Jobs on the radio. Of course, there's a great baritone aria assisted by chorus when Steve Jobs is pitching the very first iPhone in, in uh, 2007. Um, but uh, it's a, just a, it's a, as I say, a fantasia on his life. His life has turned into theatrical music and we bounce around in his life a little bit one of my favorite pieces of music is the duet in, taking place in the 70s when Steve Jobs is young. He's a sort of teenage hacker with his pal Wozniak pranking the telephone company. And they think they're really cool when they sing the fun tenor baritone duet. Marvel was just taken down. Marvel was just screwed over. Marvel was just brought to her. Money sucking, monolithic, monopolistic, autocratic, Marvel was just brought to her knees. Marvel was just brought to her knees. That's one, one for the common people. That's one. Rabbi Hoffman, that's one for Cesar Chavez, that's one, that's one for the troublemakers, rebels, and sinners who keep this planet spinning for dinner, for Bob Dylan, Dylan Thomas, Bob and Thomas, rebels, freaks, reformers who keep this planet spinning. So a very different, again, a tw 21st century opera, but a very different musical language from that of Amelia that I played you just a little bit ago. And Mason Bates always loves to incorporate technology and the sounds of technology into all of his music. I think that was one of the things that drew him to the story of the revolution of Steve Jobs, all those little beeps and boops that you get from the telephone incorporated along with acoustic instruments and um, beautiful acoustic voices. What makes the revolution of Steve Jobs a great opera? Well, like almost all great operas, it's about two things, love and death. And we follow Steve Jobs uh, in his professional life and also in his personal life, his romantic life. Uh, there's Emily Fonz as Laureen, as Jobs, Steve's uh, wife with uh, John Moore played Steve Jobs at Seattle Opera. Love and uh, death. And there's uh, Adam Lau as Kobun Chino Odagawa, who was Steve Jobs' spiritual mentor and in the opera, his sort of guide to the afterlife and the person who leads him on this journey in quest of wisdom about, well, what was this life? A little bit, I can't, I, that's all I can say about it right now. Go ahead and uh, listen to the revolution of Steve Jobs with us on our Seattle Opera Mornings on King FM. And uh, you'll, I think you'll have a really, really satisfying acoustic experience and get ready for when we can get back in. We do have more new American operas and uh, lots of stuff up our sleeves. We just need to be able to all get together again. Thanks for joining me for this, and thanks for your interest in Seattle Opera.